There is a huge problem in having any governmental agency require secrecy from its employees or its volunteers as a condition for employment or as a condition to do volunteer work. And the huge problem is called the First Amendment. Hi, everyone. Welcome to No Kill in Motion. I'm here today with Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville, Shirley Marsh from Yes Biscuit, and special guest Dana Keatley, the director and producer of Silent Shelter. I'm Dave Smith from No Kill Colorado. Dana, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so tell us the basics of the movie. Give us the Hollywood pitch on the movie. I know we've talked before, but in case people only see this video, let's let's hear what it's about. Yeah, so the documentary, it really is an intimate portrait about shelter volunteers, shelter workers, rescuers, and what happens to those individuals when they see maybe abuses or things that are happening in their local municipal shelters, and what happens to them uh, when they decide to speak out and be a voice for the animals. Yeah, and it makes me, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was seeing this is we talk a lot about leadership in shelters um, in No Kill Motion. And, you know, that's where the bottom line, there's a lot of programs and services we believe shelters should put in place. But without that leadership to actually make sure that these things are happening, um, that's where we see failure. So from the shelters you were looking at, um, you know, where's the bottom line dropping? Is it at the leadership? And sometimes leadership is the director. Sometimes it's actually like a, a city council or something like that. But what, you know, what was your experience with what you were finding out there of where the failure was really happening? Yeah, at our local shelter in Rancho Cucamonga, it really was a leadership. And again, as you mentioned, a city council issue. So at our local shelter, uh, what they did was back in 2005, they decided to go to no kill. We actually reached out. They hired Nathan Winograd to come in as a consultant. He literally put together, it's a binder. We have it. We show it in the film. Here's the transition plan. Here's what you need to do. Everything was laid out. Well, our city council and city manager decided to not listen to Nathan Winograd. We interviewed him for the documentary. We kind of got the history of what happened they went right back to that catch and kill mentality of hiring a director from a high kill shelter. So why would you expect them to be able to implement no kill? It was already a failure there. And it, you know, it comes down uh, quite often to, I'm sure, um, the population question. I'm going to ask somebody else about this. Hey, Shirley, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen it in some of the shelters that you've covered. You know, the, the first excuse is, is population, right? Um, uh, there's just too many pets. What do you think of that? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue um, because uh, a shelter population, within it you have uh, sick cats that come in, you have sick dogs that come in, you have injured animals that come in. Um, sometimes they get the treatment that they need, sometimes they don't. And then you have also dogs and cats who are made sick in the shelter. Um, and uh, you have uh, instances where cages can be safely shared and other times where they can't. Um, so you really need somebody in the leadership position who can go in and, and fine tune all of these policies, you know, rather than just say it's, you know, one dog to a cage and, and one cat and whatever. And, you know, uh, this one is healthy and treatable or, or this one isn't. Um, it really has to be individualized to the individual animal. So uh, a shelter population is uh, is a very fluid type of thing, and and um, someone has to spend the time and energy, someone who cares enough about each individual animal to be able to assess that and make decisions that are appropriate for the individual animal. Right, and we have that 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 population myth that uh, is something that we fight all the time. But there's also the myth of money, Aubrey. I, I wanted to hit you on that. Is is like ah, we don't have enough money to do this or that. Um, but I know that you've seen examples of this. 
Well, yeah, it, it's interesting because I think that people automatically equate life saving with having to spend more money. But we hear time and time again of places that transition from no kill, sometimes literally overnight, sometimes over a very short period of time, not by spending more money on, on life saving, but on taking the money that was being spent and simply spending it in a different way, right? So instead of spending a hundred bucks to, I don't know, to send an animal control officer out in the field, pick up a dog, bring the dog down to the shelter, uh, you know, examine the dog, house the dog. Well, let's spend that same money for that animal control officer to do a little bit more work in the field, to go knocking on doors or asking businesses, do you have any idea who, who owns this dog, right? So it's not so much about more spending as it is about how you spend your money. Something I was thinking about on the leadership thing though, and this, I, 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 I view it through a slightly different lens because I, I work in the legal field and our clients are cities and counties. They are the very organizations that are running these animal shelters. So I'm dealing with people from, I mean, I deal with sheriffs, judges, police chiefs, I mean, uh, public works heads, street department heads. It's always amazing to me that when you're dealing with so many other municipal departments, all of which are funded by tax dollars, that you have departments that are talking about complete transparency. Like, like if you see a pothole in the road, you can go on a website and complain about where you saw the pothole, right? Or you have a police chief standing up in front of the city council and talking about how they're gonna form a citizen's advisory committee and they're gonna do community policing and they're gonna make theirs the best police department in the nation, right? So on one side, you have people talking about all the wonderful things that they're gonna do with tax dollars for the benefit of, of the public. It's, always, it's amazing to me that when we're talking about animal shelters, that all of a sudden, well, no, uh, these are the excuses for why we're having to do this. It's because of pet overpopulation. It's the irresponsible public. So of all the, all the, the, the departments that we pay for, whether they're city or county run, why is it that in animal sheltering that we tolerate a director that says, well, let me explain to you why this isn't my fault. Um, it's just, it's, it's completely crazy. And Shirley, you said something that made me think about something. People all the time talk about pet overpopulation and say that that's why animals die in shelters. And I think Mike Fry touched on this before. There's a difference between pet overpopulation, meaning population of animals in the community and shelter overpopulation. Yes, you have problems when there is shelter overpopulation because you don't embrace the programs like Nathan Winograd developed for Rancho Cucamonga to completely transform it. And you don't, you don't manage that population. But uh, yeah, the, the, the leadership thing just always gets me because why is it that this one department where life and death decisions are being made every day that they get a pass and that the bar is so low that the baseline is, let me tell you why this isn't my fault. And Dana surely made me think of something else. I'm wondering if you uh, saw any experience on this. One of the things that, um, uh, which I think is just, a, you know, a true uh, measure of failure is if an animal comes in and they're okay, <laughs> uh, but they leave worse than they, or, or they get to the point where they're saying, oh, well, we have to kill them because now, you know, this, this animal has behavior issue or a medical issue. And it's like, didn't come in that way. Um, and of course, I'm sure that's where volunteers step up a lot. Did you see some uh, strong examples of that in, uh, in your research? Absolutely. So I, I had kind of briefly mentioned, again, we uh, did focus on shelters, uh, New York Animal Care and Control and Chicago Animal Care and Control. So these are shelters that serve a very large, right, urban population, a lot of animals coming in. They're coming in healthy. They get sick while, we're, while they're there. So we do show in Chicago, there was a big outbreak of canine influenza, right? Poor shelter practices, a lot of animals getting sick. Same thing in New York, animal care and control. You have a lot of animals in an enclosed space. They're not doing what they need to be doing to keep the animals safe and to get them out fast enough because of those poor practices. So we do show examples of that in the film. Um, in Rancho Cucamonga is a little bit different. There were some of the medical issues, but a lot of it also came down to behavior. So it becomes the excuse, well, behaviorably, right? They're unadoptable. So we can kill them and it won't count in our statistics or we can kill them and say, well, behaviorally, they can't go out. We had programs in place such as play groups, uh, dog walking programs that were in place that we were running. But when the new shelter leadership came in, they started to cut those programs down. They didn't want them. 
even though we were volunteers, we were doing them and running them for free. They started to cut those programs back. And when a group of volunteers were fired, myself included, that were really in charge of, of having run those play groups, you started to see more behavioral issues because dogs are now not getting out enough. Was the excuse on, now, put on any metric? Was it any metric? Well, like, did they, no. I, just, I just want to stop play groups. It wasn't. It was, yeah, and, and we and we mentioned this in the film. It just became a matter of they did not like us pointing out flaws, things that were happening. So they're like, okay, we'll show you. And we're going to make it more difficult for you to do certain things. Playgroups was one of those things that ended up getting cut, even though they were very successful. And we show examples of this in the film of just how things started to break down. And you brought up those perfect questions, David, why? And the audience is going to see that, like, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? It's not money because it's free help. We're volunteers that are saying we will come and do this. Grant shows a question related. I have a question related to leadership, Dana, because when you were talking, it made me think about it. I mean, Nathan comes in. What was it, two thousand five? You said yes, and then the city officially opened up as a no. Well supposed to be no kill in 2006. Okay. So, so, and that's in a, in a time frame when he was doing a lot, a lot of consulting. So he comes in, he essentially hands them what we would call the playbook. You said you physically have the binder, right? Um, why do you think it is? Because they were handed the solution, right? Related to leadership, why do you think it is that they didn't take the easy route that would make them look like rock stars and be beloved in the community and why they chose to take that different path which caused you to even have to uh, get to the point where you make a documentary, documentary film. What, what do you think happened that, that caused them to go, oh no, we're not gonna take, do this thing that's gonna save animals and, and make us look good in the community and get reelected. We're gonna do this, this, this other thing instead. Yeah, and Nathan actually does a very good job of telling this story because it really was his story and his experience. Um, but just briefly, I think it really was, it was the city manager, the city council, you know, it's essentially seven people that decided, well, no, we're not going to listen to Nathan anymore because this seems a little bit harder now. We'll just pay for it and say we did it. Again, they decided to bring in a shelter director who was from a high kill shelter on the East Coast, brought that, that director in. And as many of you probably know and have seen examples of, you know, the shelters and the shelter directors, it's like their own little fiefdom. You're not going to tell them what to do. They're going to come in and they're going to bring in their own agenda, even though the city has essentially said, yeah, we're going to follow this policy. It, it never truly got there. And we had the former mayor at the time who was essentially the one who kind of led Rancho to trying to become no kill. Unfortunately, he, his term ended and he stepped down from mayor right after the city had transitioned. So you kind of lost that initial leadership. And mm -hmm. the other council members, um, they are very well funded and backed by other groups in the city. Mm -hmm. So they easily get reelected. It's literally mm -hmm. been the same, virtually the same council members were on for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. So why, why would they feel like they need to change? You know, they were very entrenched and they figured we did this. We have a beautiful shelter. Stop complaining. Even mm -hmm. though, right, the records are showing something very different. The, the mayor leaving. The, the mayor leaving is a, a very clear example of something we talk about here all the time. There's something called the Companion Animal Protection Act, um, which actually puts guardrails in place of how a shelter must perform and the metrics they must meet. And the reason you do that, the best time to do that is when you have a mayor or a shelter director that's already doing it, or at least trying to do it, so that when they leave, the, you know, there's still those guardrails in place. We're out of time. Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, uh, everybody, this is No Kill in Motion here with Aubrey Kavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville, Shirley Marsh from Yes Biscuit, Dana Keithley, the director and producer of a new documentary, Silent Shelter. Um, before we leave, Dana, tell people how they can get in touch with you or, or, or check out more about the shelter and the trailer. Yeah, they can visit our website, www.silentsheltermovie.com. And we also have a presence on Facebook and Twitter. And we do have our Gmail address located on there as well. So if people are interested in sending us questions, uh, the film, we're currently in post-production. So we're trying to raise funds to finish all the post-production elements, but hope to start submitting to film festivals uh, by the end of the year. Super. Thank you, Dana. Everybody check out Silent Shelter. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Dana. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time in No Kill in Motion.